United Nations with that message to Russia's leadership as Russia launches an unprovoked invasion of a sovereign nation. The lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. So Sir Edward Grey lamented to a friend right before Britain's entry into World War I. This morning, the pronouncements are less and politically in a vainglorious effort to reconstruct an evil empire that killed 30 million of its own people before its own demise. Mm. Now the only question is, how will America and the West respond to this brutish use of power. The attack began early in the morning about 5 a.m. local time from neighboring Belarus, Moscow's ally with explosions in several cities across Ukraine, including the capital Kiev. Air raid sirens rang out across Kiev and Ukrainian officials reported that crews or ballistic missiles targeted military control centers. Dozens of Ukrainian soldiers have been killed so far. Officials say mostly from airstrikes and rocket launches. Ukrainian President Zelensky declared martial law, closing schools and placing hospitals on high alert. There was a mass exodus as thousands tried to flee. The invasion began just minutes after Russian President Vladimir Putin said in a public address that he authorized military action because the West had pushed too far in trying to draw the country into NATO. He also warned other countries against any retaliation, saying, quote, the response from Russia will be so severe that no foreign nations have ever experienced it before. All decisions have been made, Willie. President Biden spoke to President Zelensky of Ukraine last night, and this morning President Biden will meet with G7 leaders. He says he will announce new sanctions against Russia this afternoon. The statement from the president reads in part, the prayers of the entire world are with the people of Ukraine tonight as they suffer an unprovoked and unjustified attack by Russian military forces. President Putin has chosen a premeditated war that will bring a catastrophic loss of life and human suffering. Russia alone is responsible for the death and destruction this attack will bring, and the United States and its allies and partners will respond in a united and decisive way. The world will hold Russia accountable, a statement from President mm -hmm. Joe Biden. Joining us now from Ukraine, NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel. Uh, Richard, what does it look like on the ground there this morning? So there have been airstrikes uh, and uh, what appear to be missile strikes in numerous parts of the country, uh, mostly targeting military facilities. And I think we are still in the early hours of what could be a long campaign. Uh, I'm in Mariupol, which is in the southeast. And there has not been much damage in the center of the city, but I just came from the edge of the city and a military communications facility had uh, had been struck. The uh, a military satellite dish was smoldering and tipped over. Uh, the Ukrainian military has just put out more video that it says are Russian attack helicopters uh, attacking a, a military installation outside of Kiev. So according to the the the, uh, the Ukrainian president Zelensky, the this attack by Russia, which began about eight hours ago, came in from three different locations, from the north, from uh, Belarus, from the uh, east, uh, where Russia has had uh, border, had troops uh, stocked, uh, built up on the border, and from the south. And uh, here in, in Mariupol, there is a, an uneasy calm. People are clearly nervous. Uh, the government has imposed a, a state of emergency, calling it martial law. Uh, many people are lining up for gas, lining up at ATMs, uh, crowding into supermarkets. Uh, but we have uh, seen also more Ukrainian troops and tanks pulled closer into the city. So for now, uh, it seems that the major urban centers uh, in this country are still under government control and that uh, at this point in time, the, the, the airstrikes carried out by, by Russia and at least apparently one helicopter strike have all been on uh, military facilities. Richard, stay with us. I want to turn to NBC News senior international correspondent Kier Simmons in Moscow. Kier, for weeks now, the world has wondered, will Vladimir Putin do it? And if he does it, how will he do it? Well, we learned last night that, yes, he is happy to cross that line and that he has gone big in the early hours here. That's right. And just picking up on what uh, Richard was saying there, uh, Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesman, uh, just uh, now 
uh, briefing uh, Russian journalists, uh, and he has just said that uh, Russia's goal is to, quote, neutralize Ukraine's military potential. So question marks uh, through the morning about exactly what the Russian aim is here. And clearly we need to take these things with a pinch of salt because bluntly there have been so many lies. But right now, uh, Dmitry Peskov saying that is the goal. Uh, and that I suppose on the streets of uh, Moscow this morning to speak to ordinary Russians. Uh, they are stunned. Uh, they, many of them uh, did not expect this, even despite the, the messaging uh, from the Kremlin. Really, there were people coming up to us to try and tell us how upset they were. Take a listen. It's a disaster. I don't approve it. I don't like it and I don't want it to be like that at all. I'm scared. I'm scared of this situation because um, I'm afraid that something will happen here and I'm afraid of people who live in Ukraine. You're afraid for them? Uh, yes, I have uh, some relatives there and I'm afraid of them. It's horrible, yeah. It's horrible. It's, it should be done by, by, by diplomatic way. Oh. And we should just be clear, uh, clearly, uh, Willie, uh, Russians who speak English are, are more likely, I think you could say, uh, to be uh, opposed to this action. The one man spoke to us in Russian, said he was in favor of it. But I think don't underestimate uh, how shocked the Russians are. And, and, one, uh, and, and one more point before I leave you. Uh, there are at banks. The dollars have run out in many parts of Moscow. We're, we're hearing from one of our producers here, uh, uh, Joe, uh, that the dollars have run out. And what that tells you is that Russians are really frightened for their economy. They're frightened for watching the, the ruble plunge in value. They're going to try and get dollars and they're not able to find them in some of the banks. And that may be an indication that President Putin still struggling to bring his country with him on this. Uh, thank you, Keir. Uh, Richard Ingall, uh, let me ask you, um, what, what is the mood of the troops you've been reporting on on the front lines uh, in Ukraine? They were bracing for this, and uh, they, they knew this was coming. Uh, some people were, were living in a kind of suspended disbelief that it wouldn't happen, that Vladimir Putin wouldn't go all the way, that he would be deterred. Uh, but I think starting yesterday and the day before, when we saw a, a dramatic increase in the fire from the uh, Russian-backed separatists, uh, many of the troops that I spoke to thought that Russia was preparing the ground, that it was softening its targets. And I think at this early stage, we are still seeing that. Uh, th there was not a massive shock and awe campaign like some U.S. officials anticipated. Uh, there wasn't a devastating cyber attack. Uh, there, there haven't been uh, the, the beach assaults that uh, some people uh, uh, had been speculating. So it, it seems at this stage that the, the Russian military is still probing. It is knocking out communications. It is knocking out the, the military's uh, ability to defend the country and launch a, uh, a counterattack, potentially. But uh, the, the soldiers do believe that this is still uh, an early phase. And uh, you've been seeing that I was watching just this morning, the soldiers are, are mobilizing. They're setting up more checkpoints. They're trying to maintain civil uh, civil. Uh, order and they are also on the lookout for sleeper cells they are they are very nervous that russia uh, could have organized or infiltrated uh, groups of, of locals who are sympathetic who could suddenly come out and try and uh, carry out acts of sabotage or t try to take control of the streets so uh, richard I, I guess my question is uh, regarding their attitudes um, there's been some question uh, as to whether they'll actually fight the Russians when they come in. Uh, can you tell me uh, what their attitude was toward that resistance? Uh, is there a sense of determination uh, that they are going to push back on the Russians, or do you expect a speedy retreat? Well, it depends what the Russians throw at them uh, so far. Uh, so far, we've been seeing airstrikes, missile strikes, uh, some some helicopter assaults, uh, but we have not seen, uh, at least uh, the, as far as I'm aware, the full on uh, tank to tank battles uh, that that could be coming quite soon. And I and I think we will we will have to see what happens then when the uh, UK said that there are injured soldiers in hospital and he called for a, a national uh, he issued a national appeal for people to donate blood. Keir Simmons, yesterday, Madeleine Albright, the former Secretary of State, uh, wrote that 
An invasion will leave Russia diplomatically isolated, economically crippled, and strategically vulnerable. Uh, that has been the assessment, uh, clear-eyed assessment, of most Western diplomats and Western leaders and Western observers. This is an attack that does not make sense economically for Russia, diplomatically for Russia, and quite frankly, in the wrong, long run, um, militarily for Russia. So. Uh, it's caused a great deal of concern uh, in the West that Putin would move forward against his own long-term interests. I'm curious, have you picked any of that up uh, in Moscow from any military officials, any, uh, any uh, government officials, uh, from, from any leaders, that, that concern? Well, Joe, I just, I've just been handed uh, more uh, of uh, the... what. Dmitry Peskov, the, the Kremlin spokesman, has been saying uh, in his briefing to journalists uh, just in the, frankly, the past few minutes, in the, in the past hour, um, and I'm just looking down to read it for myself, uh, but uh, Peskov saying, no one talks about occupation. Uh, this word does not apply here. So clearly, uh, mm. again, the Russians saying they don't plan to try to occupy uh, Ukraine. Um, Again, just repeating, Russia, much about is just the simple economic fallout. The, 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 the stock exchange uh, here in uh, Russia ha had to be suspended in the early hours of the morning. As I mentioned, the ruble is falling. What will this do to the Russian economy? Just the, the, the uncertainty and, frankly, the uncertainty about how this war will play out. What will that do to the Russian economy uh, and what will that do uh, to the views of ordinary Russians? But then again, of course, uh, will that uh, leave President Putin feeling even more vulnerable, uh, perhaps, well, mm. more vulnerable and, and, and perhaps threatened? And I will mention one thing that I found chilling in President Putin's statement, which again has been replayed on Russian television um, through the morning, because we're talking about the threats of sanctions from the West. Uh, President Putin in that speech uh, talked about Russia's nuclear capability uh, and then went on to say Russia has uh, advantages in the late, in, uh, has some advantages in the latest types of weapons, and he says, in this regard, no one should, ha should uh, have any doubt that a direct attack on Russia will lead to defeat and dire consequences for a potential aggressor. So that appeared to be President Putin mentioning Russia's nuclear capability and, and threatening uh, Western leaders. And, and just before uh, these, uh, this, the beginning of this, uh, this military operation, we did hear from the French uh, who obviously have had a good deal of contact uh, from with President uh, Putin, and one French official describing him as erratic. Uh, certainly, uh, officials uh, here with close contacts to the Kremlin have told me that President Putin uh, will be himself uh, at, at mm -hmm. the head of this operation, uh, very much in charge. Uh, so, in that sense, I think we we kind of depend that he, on that he is acting rationally. Uh, that, that, that is something that uh, we depend on, even though uh, what is happening right now for many Russians looks, looks pretty irrational. Well, and, and, and what you've just underlined is the grave concern here, uh, uh, along with the invasion of Ukraine that makes absolutely no sense, is the erratic nature of this attack and his continued use of a nuclear threat, which he and Russian state TV and Russian diplomats have been doing for the past two months. And so far, his threats seem to be uh, coming to fruition. NBC's Keir Simmons in Moscow and NBC's Richard Engel reporting from southeast Ukraine. Thank you both. We'll be checking be back safe. in with you throughout the morning. Let's bring in the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas, former U.S. ambassador to Russia, now director of the Institute for International Studies at Stanford and an NBC News international affairs analyst, Michael McFall and former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, retired four-star Navy Admiral James Stavridis. He is Chief International Security and Diplomacy Analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. Ambassador McFall, let's begin with you, and let's uh, pick up where we left off on the erratic nature of Vladimir Putin, the erratic nature of this attack, the illogical uh, nature of this attack. I, I quoted Madeleine Albright, who wrote that the invasion will leave Russia diplomatically isolated, economically crippled, and strategically strategically vulnerable. It will. All three of those things are, 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 are obvious, not fairly obvious. They are obvious. This is an irrational attack. Uh, uh, one European country invading another European country in 2022. And his response uh, to that attack and any threats is, uh, do not defend Ukraine. 
uh, I will employ nuclear weapons. And he's been saying that for the past few months. They've said it on state TV about reducing the West to ashes. Uh, you've had diplomats making the same threats. Uh, this is not, uh, uh, by any stretch of imagination, a rational man, even by the old Soviet communist standards when exactly. uh, when we actually had back channels and uh, there was uh, some rhyme and some reason to what the old Soviet Empire did. I agree. It's tragic. It's irrational. It's also evil. Let's just call it for that. There is good and evil in the world. And this is an evil act. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been saying this forever, Joe. I mean, I hate to say this, but you know, my last call in the Washington Post was Putin does not think like we do. We keep thinking he's going to do some cost benefit analysis. Think about how sanctions might affect, the, you know, the prices, Bear Bank and the stock market next week. That's not who Vladimir Putin is. Uh, and he's proven that today on this incredibly tragic day. Uh, it is erratic. It is irrational. I actually think it will come back to haunt him. Uh, I think mm -hmm. Brezhnev overreacted and overreached in Afghanistan after a series of wins in the 1970s. I think this will be Putin's Afghanistan moment, but it'll come at a terrible price and a terrible cost to the Ukrainian people. And I, I do not, there is no rationality here. He is, he is motivated by some crazy ideas. I want to really emphasize that. I listened to his speech on Monday. I listened to his speech last night. He's talking about denazification. There are no Nazis in Ukraine. Oof. The leader of Ukraine is not a Nazi. He's a democratically elected leader. He's Jewish. He is not a Nazi. And for, for just, to, I, I, I'm sorry I'm so emotional, but we've got to get over the fact that we're going to deal with this guy in some real politic cost benefit analysis. We've got to treat him as an irrational, evil leader who is unjustly and grossly attacked a free and democratic Ukraine. Yeah, that was a bizarre reference and a chilling speech from President Putin and Admiral Stavridis. We also heard from President Zelensky addressing his nation yesterday, but really speaking to the people of Russia as well and making a last ditch plea with them to tell Putin, to tell their government, we don't want war with Ukraine. We don't want war with our neighbor. But you have led NATO troops as Supreme Allied Commander. You know Europe very well. What is Putin's objective here? Richard Engel said so far it doesn't quite look like shock and awe, but this is the early hours here. What would you expect to see next and to what end for Vladimir Putin? What does he want here? Well, I'm with uh, Mike McFall. I think we ought to listen to Vladimir Putin, go back and read his speech from last night. What he's after is essentially occupying Ukraine. I find it laughable that his spokesman this morning is saying there's no intent to occupy. That's the 975th lie that's come out of the Kremlin going back to we're not going to invade. So pretty clearly, he intends to subjugate Ukraine. Um, I think this is the beginning of a significant campaign, and it is starting exactly as a military planner would put it together, which is to say, take out the air defense systems take out the command and control, terrify the population to put a huge refugee burden on the outgoing government, uh, terrify the international community. Um, if that's not shock and awe, I don't know what is. And I think the next thing you're gonna see are gonna be pretty serious movements of troops and tanks led by, and there go the air raid sirens in real time. Hey, we're watching the History Channel unfold in real time here, by the way. We are on a rocket so, ride back to the 1930s. Jeez. Richard Haas, uh, you have a piece out. The West must show Putin just how wrong he is to choose war. But so far, so far, he's listening to no one. And all predictions of just how bad things can be are coming true. What is the worst option at this point, And what can the U.S. do? Well, the worst option, Mika, is to allow Mr. Putin to succeed with this unwarranted, unjustified, illegal, immoral war of choice. There was no necessity that Russia do what he has now done. But it's not axiomatic that what Madeleine Albright and others have been saying uh, will come to pass. That's our challenge now. We need now a responsive mm -hmm. necessity 
to his war of choice. And there's got to be to raise the economic costs at home, to raise the military <laughs> costs on the ground. I hate to be so blunt, but he, you know, the most vulnerable thing that, that, that Putin's vulnerable to is, is dead Russian soldiers. So we have to make sure Ukraine has the means to, to, to resist. We've got to raise the political costs at home. We've got to reach out to Russian journalists, to Russian civil society, to begin to try to influence uh, what goes on back there. Diplomatically, we need to isolate Russia. We can't do a lot in the Security Council. We saw that last night. Take it to the General Assembly. Push for a uniting for peace resolution. Get countries to line up one way or the other. Reach out to China. See if we can't get, bring some daylight between Russia and China. We need to think about this with every tool we have. We shouldn't be sanguine, but history does offer some comfort. Wars of choice like this one, they often begin well, but they often end badly. We've seen that for the United States. We saw it for Russia and Afghanistan. And the two keys are, one, to raise the costs on the ground, for the invading country, and two, to build opposition at home, to basically feed the weariness and wariness of the home population. That is what we need to do here. Admiral Strafidis, um, we've tried diplomacy. Uh, we, uh, all along, uh, were concerned that it was going to fail. The French, the Germans, uh, everybody in NATO has tried diplomacy. It's not going to work here. We, we've, we've known that, but you still have to do that with a nuclear power. So we've entered into a new phase. Uh, if, if the United States and NATO wants to throw everything they have at Vladimir Putin, short of sending American troops into Ukraine and starting World War III, what do we do? Uh, you start by fully activating what's called the NATO Response Force. This is about 30,000 uh, troops, airmen, seamen, uh, uh, soldiers, obviously. Um, you flood them forward to the borders of the alliance. Look, if you're waking up in Europe this morning, I hope you're a member of NATO. You want to be inside this alliance this morning. And by the way, if you're waking up in Stockholm, Sweden or Helsinki, Finland, two very capable nations that are outside of the alliance, I would be thinking about how quickly can I get inside this alliance. What the alliance will do this morning, Joe, in Brussels, the North Atlantic Council, will hold sessions. Um, all of the military leaders will convene. Uh, my successor, General Todd Walters, will be talking to all of the counterpart leaders of the military. And I think you're going to see NATO bring that NATO response force right up to the borders of the alliance, not as an act of war. I like Richard Haas's phrase. It's a response of necessity. We need to show Putin what the alliance is capable of. And doing that in the air, on the sea, moving our ships forward and our troops to the border, to me, makes a lot of sense. I'll close by saying, you know, Putin is going to look pretty powerful and pretty strong as he rolls over for the third time a very weak neighbor militarily. But, you know, the alliance outspends Russia 10 to 1 on military spending. We outnumber him in troops on the ground 3 or 4 to 1. We have thousands more military capable aircraft, many more warships. He's not going to try to cross a NATO border in anger. This is the moment to emphasize that point with him. I think that will help clarify his mind as he deals with the consequences of what's going to happen inside Ukraine. And just as the admiral's been speaking, the secretary of general of NATO has said this, quote, peace on our continent has been shattered. We now have war in Europe on a scale and on a type we thought belonged to history. Ambassador McFall, you know Vladimir Putin. You've sat across from Vladimir Putin. You understand this man. More sanctions today we hear are coming from President Biden from the United States. I suspect that's not going to have Putin call the troops home from Ukraine. What will get his attention? What can NATO do? What can the West do? What can the United States do to prevent this from becoming as bad as so many people are predicting it will be? Well, first, what Admiral Stravridis just said, I, I support 100 percent. We want to make sure that Mr. Putin understands that uh, any attack on any NATO ally is attack on all of us. And, and we want to make sure that that goes to a zero probability event. Number two, I hope and expect that President Biden and the, the free world will today today, not, not weeks from now, but today, mm -hmm. impose the most comprehensive sanctions against Russia ever. 
There's no ratcheting. There's no waiting. There's no incrementalism. It has to be everything today. Shock and awe in terms of economic sanctions. And number three, we need to massively, massively increase our military and humanitarian and medical assistance to Ukraine today. Just a few hours ago, I was on a Zoom call with many Ukrainian friends, and we've been training Ukrainians here at Stanford for uh, two decades. And one of them said something very, very soberly. He said, I'm ready to fight. I bought my kit, but my knee pads aren't very good. There's a shortage of knee pads in Ukraine because you're going to be on your knees when you're shooting. And I hate to sound so blunt, but he said, send us more knee pads, Mike. Um, and so we have to do everything we can to supply the military first and foremost. I worry that they're going to run out of ammunition. They're going to run out of stingers. They're going to run out of javelins. And that will give the Russian army an advantage. But we have to do everything we can to support those that are fighting uh, on their own. Because at the end of the day, it's fantastic that we have NATO. Thank God we expanded NATO, this incredibly stupid debate we've been having for the last several weeks. Imagine a Europe without NATO expanded. That's great. But as one of my Ukrainian friends just emailed me a couple hours ago, Mike, I can't believe we are facing this bastard alone. And at the end of the day, the Ukrainians are fighting Putin alone. We have to do whatever we can to help them in that fight. How important is it uh, for us, Admiral uh, Stravitas, uh, just as Ambassador McFaul said, I'm sure we'll all agree here, uh, the, the sanctions that get put in place can't be incremental. We've, we've tried that. I understand why we tried it. Uh, and and I, I think any reasonable, rational leader would have tried that. Uh, but just as we have to implement every tool that we have in our toolkit in terms of, uh, of sanctions today, uh, how important is it today that we start the movement of our troops uh, into our NATO uh, allies countries, into Poland, into Estonia, uh, into into every country uh, that we can that that is is close to Russia and that borders Ukraine? Um, it is vital. And I think you will see that. And, you know, the NATO alliance often gets knocked for. Uh, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of committees, a lot of talk, talk, talk. It can also move very, very fast. And I think you're going to see that. You're going to see troops, tanks, armor, warships, all of it flowing toward those Russian borders. Again, give Putin what he doesn't want here, government in exile. And both uh, Richard Haas and Mike McFaul correctly talk about imposing costs in terms of strengthening Ukrainian resistance. That is step one, is to have Ukrainians believe and know they have a functioning Ukrainian government. That team, that Zelensky team, has got to be protected, and they have to be capable of setting in place that resistance and directing it. You know, um, Richard Haas, uh, the Chinese have a decision to make. Um, and it, it, obviously, uh, China is having trouble economically. Uh, they're struggling with COVID, a uh, bad outbreak in Hong Kong. They have very little resistance. It's going to sweep across the country. They're not in a position to flex their muscles right now. Uh, and they have a choice to make. They can either, uh, they can either get in bed uh, with a country that has a GDP that's smaller than the state of Texas, uh, or uh, they can side with the United States and our allies in the EU who have a 40 trillion dollars, but between us, 40 trillion dollars in GDP. It's like 40 trillion to Russia's one and a half trillion. And yet this morning, China's foreign minister refused to call Russia's actions an invasion and rejected any comparison to Taiwan. China accused the United States of fanning the flames and called on all parties to maintain restraint. I understand the game of triangulation that uh, Russia and China are playing right now. But you look at it economically. You look at where China is economically. You look where China is with COVID. It doesn't seem to be like a very wise play, especially since they're trading partners with Ukraine. And by the way, side note, please respond to this too. Israel also, a country whose neck this country has stuck its a country who we've stuck our neck out for since 1948 
refusing to condemn Russia, refusing to call this an invasion. Talk about China. Talk about Israel. China wants to have it both ways. Uh, and what they often do in these situations, Joe, is they abstain. Uh, and you're right. We ought to basically force them to take sides. What Russia has done, let's just be clear. It has violated China's, not just the world's, China's most basic tenet of international relations, which is non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. This has been a basic of Chinese foreign policy since 1949, since the end of their civil war. So normally they would oppose it. Plus, think about it. Think of the precedent for Taiwan, which is what the Chinese are, are, are nervous about. If, imagine someone decided to recognize a movement by Taiwan to be independent apart from the rest of China. That's just what Russia did in recognizing these republics in, in eastern Ukraine. So China's got to be very uneasy. What we want to basically tell China is this is going to really make a bad situation worse in terms of our bilateral relationship if you come out wrong here. Plus you are going to get caught up in bad sanctions. There's going to be sanctions, and if you keep doing business with Russia as normal, sanctions are going to hit China. And that's the last thing, as you say, China needs coming out of COVID at a time when Chinese growth rates are maybe one-third what they used to be a decade ago. So we ought to have a, shall we say, heart-to-heart -heart with China, but also talk about the possibilities of a U.S.-Chinese relationship, because we'd like to begin the process of shoehorning China away from Russia. Israel, in a similar sort of way, Israel has calculations. Russia, they see, has having become the most important country in the Middle East. They're the only ones with real ties to Syria to Saudi Arabia, to some of the Palestinians. The United States no longer plays that role. Israel's also concerned about Russian Jews, so they're going to be careful here. And again, we ought to tell Israel, this is our expectation. This is one of those moments where you have to step up. This is fundamental to the United States. It's fundamental to the Western world. You are part of the Western world. We have got to be able to count on you here. And those conversations likely have intensified this morning, given what we've seen in the last eight hours. Ambassador McFall, before we let you go, I just want to take a step back for our audience. There have been some cynical politicians who said, oh, who cares what happens in Ukraine? We've got our own problems at home. Probably Americans going about their lives saying, why is this so important? So for you, could you articulate why you believe in this moment it is so important to turn back Vladimir Putin? Why is this a moment in history that is so worthy of the world's attention? This reminds me of September 1st, 1939, when Hitler invaded Poland. And remember, in the 30s, lots of Americans said, why do we care about Czechoslovakia? Where is Poland? This is not our war. This is not our problem. That's what they said, American firsters, an echo of a, a sentiment that we have in this country today. But what has happened now is this is an assault, not just on Ukrainian sovereignty, this is an assault, an assault on the, the system of the international order that we created in 1945. And if the free world doesn't stand up for independent, democratic, free Ukraine here, it has consequences all over the world. What Richard, Richard was just saying about China, it has major consequences all over the world. And that's why we have to, there is good and evil in the world. There is right and wrong in the world. And that's why we have to stand for the right side and for the non-evil side. And that's why we have to stand with independent Ukraine. We're not gonna go to war over Ukraine. The president has made that clear, but we need to do mm. everything else we can to stop Putin's evil, illegitimate invasion of this sovereign democratic country. So, uh, Richard Haas, before I came on the air, I, I, I was surprised, as you know, a long time, i had been a long time supporter of Israel. Before we came on the air, I read a report in The New York Times that Israel uh, had not uh, was not going to condemn Russia, but for the same reasons that you said at 607 a.m., uh, about uh, 30 minutes before. I guess Israel decided uh, they weren't going to have it both ways. Uh, the Russian attack of Ukraine is a severe violation of international order. Israel condemns the attack and is prepared to provide humanitarian assistance to the citizens of Ukraine. Israel has long experience in wars. The war is not the way to resolve conflict. So obviously um, that's 28 minutes ago. Yeah, that's 28 minutes ago. Obviously, Israel uh, not calculating. And I suspect I will say it uh, again uh, about China. I suspect because China is in such a weak position right now uh, because uh, you, you look at their GDP 
it's falling. Uh, you look at the fact, again, that they're facing the, the challenges that they're facing. Uh, are they really going to side with a country that has a GDP smaller than the state of Texas? Or are they going to side with the United States and the EU and the rest of the world uh, if, in fact, they need their economy kick-started? Uh, quite possibly. And again, that's where sanctions could really uh, come in if the Chinese continue to conduct certain types of transactions. My hunch is very quickly they will get caught up in sanctions. Can I just build on one thing Ambassador McFall said that Mike said here, Joe, uh, which is every and I, I totally concur that you know, what's at stake here is the principle that countries ought not to be violating the sovereignty of others or not to be changing borders by force. If there's a, a tenet of international relations that gives us some order, it's that. One other thing, though, you know, Ukraine was uh, pressured or persuaded to give up its nuclear weapons. And what's happened now? They are being invaded. We do not want to send the lesson, because it's already a lesson out there after Libya and after Saddam, that giving up nuclear weapons can be perilous to your health. I do not want countries around the world, including Iran, to come to the conclusion, as I fear they may have, that nuclear weapons are essential. And I don't want other countries around the world, our partners in Asia, our partners in Europe, uh, people in the Middle East, to think nuclear weapons are the only ultimate guarantee. Look what happens to leaders. Look what happens to countries when you give them up. So we've got that added stake here. We have got to show that giving up nuclear weapons does not mean you put your lives, your country at stake. President of the Council on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas, former U.S. Ambassador to Russia, Michael McFaul, and former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, retired four-star Navy Admiral James Savridis. Thank you all very much. Noon. Joining us now, NBC News Senior White House Correspondent Kelly O'Donnell. Kelly, what are you hearing from administration officials? Will he throw the book at them full, full on all sanctions? Well, we've asked that question, Mika, and we have not gotten a response about how far the president wants to go. What we expect is that he is getting briefings. He certainly was overnight and will this morning, having those direct uh, communications with fellow leaders and trying to get an assessment of what is happening on the ground. And it is a combination of trying to get a sense of what European leaders are prepared to do and then preparing to talk to the American people probably around noon today, early afternoon, we're told. Mm -hmm. So trying to get an assessment of, is this the moment to go as far as possible, or do they want to hold some things in reserve uh, with the presumption that Putin is not yet finished? But clearly there will be another layer of sanctions and trying to bring more economic pain and consequence and cost to Putin. Part of the challenge for the president here is to find a way to describe to the American people what is at stake, to put more American resources into this in terms of military equipment, personnel, and so forth, bolstering the eastern flank. Again, not U.S. personnel inside Ukraine, but trying to support our partners and allies who are in NATO, who could become vulnerable depending on uh, what spillover there could be. Always in war, there are the unintended consequences, and it is not clear exactly how far Vladimir Putin wants to go. He has not been truthful about his intentions thus far, and clearly we're now in an active kinetic phase. So that's part of it. There will be an economic piece to this where Americans will experience that in gas prices, and then there is a larger sort of uh, existential question about the cost of democracy and what the mm -hmm. American people are willing to do as far as supporting a partner like this. It has been a couple of generations since Americans have been tested in this way and being asked mm -hmm. to, uh, to put it in those terms. So there are real leadership challenges for the president to try to get Europe on the same page and keep them, of course, it's their neighborhood we're talking about, and also trying to communicate this to the American people. We'll be watching all of that closely this morning. Morning. And as we learn about meetings and phone calls, we'll bring that to you. Please do. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell, thank you. And Joe, obviously not a lot of time uh, at this point. This is happening all in real time. Um, and there are a lot of options for President Biden. What do you think he should do? Well, everything. He needs to go all everything. in, everything that we can do. Uh, Joe Biden has said from the very beginning, and any, any member of Congress that suggests otherwise is just being reckless when they say we should send troops into Ukraine. Anybody that's followed it uh, understands that U.S. troops being introduced into Ukraine a world uh, war. Is, is a, triggers a world war, triggers World War III. 
But we need to do everything short of that. Uh, we need to send as much aid and coordinate aid with our NATO allies and even.